30 seconds to look at questions 1 to 3. Hello, Accommodation Department. How can I help you? Uh, do you look after accommodation for international students? Yes, uh, we look after accommodation for all the students. Good. I hope you can help me then. I've only just been accepted onto a postgraduate course and I want to know if there is any accommodation available from this September. I know it's very short notice. Mm, yes, uh, it, it is rather late, but I'm sure we'll be able to find you something. Uh, first of all, can you give me your name and student number so that I can find you on the system? Sure. My name is Maria Teresa Gonzalez. Maria Teresa Gonzalez. Uh, how do you spell that? G-O-N-Z-A-L-E-Z. -E Thank you. Got it. And your student number, please? S H U three zero zero. 715PG. SHU 300715PG. Ah, here you are. Department of Modern Languages. Yes, that's me. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 4 to 6. OK, now there are several options for postgraduate students. Firstly, there is the Trigon. Uh, this is a new block near to the station and not far from the main campus. Accommodation is what we call cluster accommodation. What does that mean? Uh, there's a small group of rooms, usually six, each with its own bathroom clustered around a lounge kitchen area which is shared. Oh, I see. That sounds good. They are very popular. Uh, the price for these is £99 per week and we do have some availability left. However, for postgraduate students, there are other options. And what are they? Uh, there's another apartment block called The Cube located near the west gate of the campus. Accommodation there is in one or two bedroom self-contained flats. So The Cube is self-contained? How does that work? Well, basically, they're just like ordinary apartments. Each apartment has one or two study bedrooms with ensuite bathroom, a lounge and a kitchen. And what is the price of those? Uh, for the one bedroom, it is £180 per week. And for the two bedroom, it is £110 per week for each person. And can I choose who I share with? If you have a friend and you would like to share with them, of course, we can reserve a two-bedroom apartment for you both. Otherwise, you just have to share with whoever else is there. Uh, obviously, it will be another woman. Hmm. I will have to think about this. Do I have to make a decision now? No, but we don't have much accommodation left, so I can't guarantee that there will still be availability if you leave it too long. Yes, that's fair. I have a friend in the management department who might like to share. I will speak with her and get back to you this afternoon. OK, fine. Uh, do let us know as soon as you can. I will do. Thanks for all your help. My pleasure. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 2. Test 1. Section 2. You will hear a trainer giving a talk to people who want to learn outdoor survival skills. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 16. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our outdoor survival program. As you know, this week you'll be learning some of the basic information and skills you need to look after yourself independently in the outdoors. These first two days, we'll be based here in the classroom and then we'll be taking a camping trip to put into practice some of the things you've learned. I'm going to start off with the topic of food. And to start with, I'll describe just two methods which we'll be putting into practice at our camp and which make use of natural resources, the steam pit and the bamboo pot. I've got two posters here to make things clearer, and I'll start with the steam pit here. To make this, you'll need some dry sticks, some grass, some loose earth, and some stones. And for this week only, some matches. <laughs> the first thing you do is to dig a shallow pit in the place you've chosen to do your cooking. Let's say about 25 centimeters deep and 30 centimeters wide. Your sticks have to be a bit wider than the pit because you have to put a line of them along the top from one end of the pit to the other. Before setting light to these, you take some large stones and arrange them on top. Then you start the fire and wait till the wooden platform burns through and the stones fall into the pit. At this point, brush away any pieces of hot ash from the stones. You can use a handful of grass and then take another stick and push it down into the center of the pit between the stones. After that, you cover the whole pit with a thick layer of grass. And then you can put your food on it, wrapped in more pieces of grass like parcels. Finally, cover the whole thing with earth. You have to pat it firmly to seal the pit. Then all you have to do is take the stick out and pour a bit of water into the opening that it leaves. It should take about four hours for your food to cook as it cooks slowly in the steam that's created inside the pit. Now you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. So, simple but effective. The other method you're going to practice this week is the bamboo oven. Now the steam pit is ideal in certain conditions because the heat is below ground level. For example, if there's a strong wind and you're afraid a fire might spread. But when it's safe to have an open fire, you can use the bamboo oven method. You get a length of bamboo, which, as you probably know, is hollow and consists of a number of individual sections with a wall in between. You use a sharp stick to make a hole in each of the dividing walls apart from the end one. Then you lean the bamboo over a fire with the top propped up by a forked stick and the bottom sitting on the ground. You pour enough water in the top to fill the bottom section and then light a fire underneath that section to heat the water. 
Then you put your food inside the top section, and the steam coming up the bamboo through the holes you made cooks it. I'm going to move on now to food itself and talk about some of the wild plants you might cook. I'm going to begin with fungi. That's mushrooms and toadstools. I'm sure you'll be aware that some of these are edible and they're delicious, but some of them are highly poisonous. Now, whether they're poisonous or not, all fungi that you find in the wild should be cooked before eating because that helps to destroy any compounds in them that might be mildly toxic. But be aware that any amount of cooking won't make poisonous varieties any safer to eat. Unless you can definitely identify a fungus, you should never eat it. It's not worth the risk. And you need to be really sure, because some fungi that are poisonous are very similar in appearance to certain edible varieties. They can easily be mistaken for each other. So, having said all that, fungi are delicious when they're freshly picked, and although they are only moderately nutritious, they do contain minerals which the body needs. I'll move on now to leafy plants, which are generally... That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a student, Alex, asking his tutor for advice about essay writing. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 21 to 27. Hi, Alex. Come in. I gather you wanted some help with writing essays. Yes. I'm finding this first term difficult, and I'm worried about the assignments we have to do for January. Well, let me see if I can help. You shouldn't panic about it, because essay writing is a very straightforward process, really. What it involves is organizing the information that you want to include. You shouldn't have more than you can easily manage within the word count. Make sure you haven't got too much or anything irrelevant. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to look at that and work out what you need and what you don't need before you start. And then you just have to think about how you're going to put forward your argument. Oh, that sounds very straightforward when you put it like that. <laughs> but I'm worried I haven't got the necessary skills for writing an effective essay because English is my second language. Mm. Well, perhaps you misunderstand the skills you need. You need to be able to analyse your data and then I would say the skills of interpretation and expressing yourself are important. Perhaps it's this last one that bothers you, but the more essays you write, the more you will develop these skills. Yes, and I don't quite know how to improve at that. Though, as you say, I know practice will help. Mm. And I need to make sure I've got everything ready before I start. Yes, 
What is vital to good essay writing is preparation, so make sure you build in enough time to do the research you need. Are there any other sources I can use to help me with essays? Yes. You should go to the library and look through the reference section, because there are books that focus on the style we use in academic writing, and those will help you a lot. The other thing that you should think about is what happens when you've actually written your essay. Too many students just complete their work and hand it in, whereas what you should be doing is making sure that you edit it as thoroughly as possible. Oh, yes, that's a good idea. Then I'd pick up any mistakes and also see if it reads logically. Exactly. Uh, the other thing is, again, what a lot of students do is get their essays back, look at the marks, then just file it away. Hmm. They don't realise that if they checked it through and looked at what the tutor had written, then they can learn from their old essays. Yeah, I can see that's a good idea. So, is that OK? You can always come back to me. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 28 to 30. Actually, there were a couple of other things I wanted to ask you about essay writing. Uh -huh. I had had a few thoughts of my own about what I should do, such as really taking good notes when I'm reading, because that helps, doesn't it? Mm, I think it improves your knowledge rather than your actual writing. Uh, but one tip I can give you is to try and not read too much. Otherwise, you end up including irrelevant material in your essay. Remember to stay on task. Yes. Sometimes I have problems interpreting the questions correctly, or the whole question seems overwhelming to me. Mm. What I try to do is highlight the key parts and divide it into smaller chunks so I can manage it. Well, you might find it useful to break it down even further by making sure you understand all the words perfectly before you start. Uh, things like assess or comment and such like. Yes, I see. Sometimes, after an objective analysis, the question actually asks you for a subjective opinion. But you must remember to support your arguments, if that's the case. Mm. Um, one final comment I can make is about using your own words. You must try to do this as far as possible. You're expected to summarise what you've read, not just string together a list of quotations. In fact, you shouldn't have too many. Just use them where it's really important. OK, thanks. Do you read other students' essays when you've finished? No. Why? Is that a good idea? Well, you can confuse each other, so I'd advise against it. But it's up to you. OK. Uh, thanks very much for your time. And that is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a teacher talking about several British art galleries. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 33. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 33. Good afternoon. Welcome to the first class of V100 Art and History. The objectives of the course, as you will have seen if you've taken a look at the syllabus, include familiarizing yourselves with the vocabulary and language of art, learning about the basic elements of art and design, and finally, discussing historical periods as they pertain to art. The course will also give you the opportunity to visit some of the many galleries and museums that Britain has to offer. So, having said that, I'd like to spend the rest of today's class talking about four of the more important galleries that we will be visiting in the coming year. As most of you already know, or at least I hope most of you know, there are four Tate Galleries in all. To begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Tate Modern. Tate Modern is located in a very busy part of London called the South Bank. It's close to two world-renowned tourist attractions, St. Paul's Cathedral and Shakespeare's Globe Theatre. Now, interestingly enough, Tate Modern is housed in what was a power station built in several stages between 1947 and 1963. It was closed down in 1981 and reopened as a gallery in the year 2000. Tate Modern consists of five levels, with the Tate Collection being shown on the third and fifth levels. On level two, the works of contemporary artists are exhibited, while level four is used for holding large temporary exhibitions. Since this museum opened, it has become a popular spot for both Londoners and tourists alike. And believe it or not, it doesn't cost anything to get in to see the collection displays. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 34 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 34 to 40. Now, the second gallery I'd like to talk about is Tate St. Ives, which is in Cornwall. It was built on the site of a gas works, and it overlooks Porthmure Beach. Tate St. Ives is housed in a three-story building that was designed by the architects Evans and Shalliff. It was established in 1993, seven years before Tate Modern was opened, and the gallery exhibits the works of modern British artists, including members of the St. Ives School, a group of artists living and working in the area from the 30s onwards. In later lectures, we'll be looking at the work of some of the artists who belong to that group and the ways in which they influenced each other. Okay, am I going too fast for any of you? No? Good. Next, I want to talk about Tate Britain, which is a gorgeous gallery situated right in the heart of Westminster. Tate Britain was the first of the four Tate galleries to open, and it was established in 1897. It was built on the site of an old prison, and when it first opened its doors, it was called the National Gallery of British Art. Later, it became known as the Tate Gallery, after the man who founded it, Sir Henry Tate. During its lifetime, Tate Britain has been damaged twice, 
once by floodwaters from the River Thames, and once by bombings during World War II. This gallery has an interesting range of exhibitions of historic and modern art from 1500 up to the present day. Now, the last gallery I'd like to tell you about is called Tate Liverpool. It's not hard to figure out where this gallery is located, is it? It was opened in 1988 to exhibit displays from the Tate Collection, and it also has a program of temporary exhibitions. Tate Liverpool is housed in what was once a warehouse, and for some years it was one of the biggest galleries of modern and contemporary art in the UK. Well, that's a brief overview of just a few of the galleries we'll be visiting. I'd like now to look in a little more detail at what you can expect to see in each of these galleries, starting with Tate Britain. That is the end of Part 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.